right, so Fred, we're starting with something that has all the rest of us sort of heading for the halls if they get off your arm. Yeah, well, there is just a little bit of an ick factor here, but you know, this actually is not just a yard and garden show, it's a home yard and garden show. And one of the insects that's been in the news just a lot in, in recent years have been bed bugs. So I thought that, you know, maybe now would be time to actually bring some bed bugs on and uh, and go ahead and show the, uh, show the viewing audience what they look like, their size, and maybe talk just a little bit about them. And again, the best way to do that if you're an entomologist, of course, is that you, you put them on uh, on your hand in this case. So here are two female bed bugs that we can see, and you can sort of see the size relative uh, to, to my fingers. So, you know, they're about three eighths of an inch to a quarter of an inch long, kind of a maroon color. And actually both of these, I'm see are, are beginning to uh, feed on me. So I just thought a little itchy <laughs> sensation. Nice. So we'll see what they do over the course of the season. Again, bed bugs have become a, a fairly significant problem in uh, throughout the United States, uh, mostly because of the way that we handle ants and cockroaches, feeding them with, uh, treating them with baits as opposed to residual sprays. Of course, uh, bed bugs feed on blood, so they don't take baits. And so while we control the, the the ants and the spiders and the roaches and those things, the, uh, the bed bugs continue to increase in numbers. And they have become a serious problem uh, throughout much United States and certainly they are, they're here in Nebraska, uh, in Lincoln and throughout, throughout the state. So again, you might want to take a, a look at them, just sort of get the relative size. You know, so if there are any unusual bites, particularly around the top part of the body, uh, you might want to do an inspection you know, of the bed, of side tables, and just see if you find them. In terms of control, I, I just recommend a professional. You want to hire a pest control operator who's had experience with bed bugs uh, to control them. They're very difficult to control. Usually takes two, two or three applications if it's a heavy uh, infestation. So I'm just gonna let them sit there for a little while and uh, see what they do. And, and we're all already convinced that entomologists are your own breed of cat. Well, well Kim, what I always say about entomologists, you just gotta be that much different than everybody else. It looks okay. easier than the nights you had the wasps thing in your friends. So <laughs> that, 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 right. that, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, Zach. Uh, what? What? Did you bring that back, or did you find that no, here? I found this right outside our uh, right outside our office. This is uh, knotweed, and any one of a zillion different uh, summer annuals as well as winter <coughs> annuals are germinating right now. And uh, along the uh, next to the bare areas, the hot spots next to sidewalks. Uh, not we, it's, it looks like crabgrass in some cases, or if you've seeded there, it looks like small turf grass seedlings and you're probably patting yourself on the back, but the bottom line is most of those are weeds that come in along, uh, along the hot spots and sidewalks. We can fight this with chemistry. Uh, uh, Pre-emergent herbicides will help control this, especially ones that control, uh, ones that have contained isoxaben. But uh, in reality, you have to do something with the traffic. And I'm almost to the point now, instead of uh, just ending the sidewalk where it's at, maybe put pavers in there or something else that just uh, completely eliminates the problem. All right, thanks, Zach. I socks a pen. I socks a ben. A ben. I S O X B E N. B E N. I socks a ben. Excellent. All right, Lauren, you have a stick. I have a stick, oh, and, and my recommendation is going to be pruners. That's P R U N E R. <laughs> and I'm going to show that here in just a little bit. We're going to keep it simple tonight. Um, a lot of people outside doing some cleanup. This is just a red twig dogwood that has Cytospora canker, and you can see that by the color change that you see anytime on shrubs when you see this kind of abrupt change. A lot of times this will just be a discrete lesion area. You can see little black specks in there. Those are the fruiting structures of the fungus. That's where all the spores are coming from. Um, so that's what you want to remove from the landscape. So as you're cleaning up, if you see this type of, of thing, that's something to take out. Uh, and then you're, you're going to reduce that potential for disease. How far below the site of the canker? I would go with fungal cankers, usually we say two to three inches below All right. is plenty. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Jeff, you have beauty. They're gorgeous. Well, it's unusual. I don't know if it's uh, beautiful, but I, uh, I think so. for most of us, not, not much is flowering right now. We talked about daffodils, but uh, for trees and shrubs. And so I thought I'd bring something in that might be a little unusual. The, the one with the long purple catkins is a um, giant hazelnut, so Corylus maxima. And so it has purple leaves, it's very ornamental. Mm -hmm. uh, and those catkins are kind of otherworldly. Um, the other one is a Swedish aspen. 
So a lot of the poplars, it's a poplar, and so you'll notice the cottonwoods, the quaking aspens, I know some of the way here tonight are all starting to do the same thing. So our early flowering trees here. Which are actually wonderful. I think I think the fringe on the catkins looks a little bit like old fashioned drapery fringe or something oh, like that. Right. Yeah. I just think those are so cool. Oh, I know it, I know it. Okay, Fred, so actually one of the things we're doing this uh, this season with our viewers is we're trying to do more pictures as we ask okay. questions. Your first set of pictures is actually bed bugs. Oh. So I think that you sent them to us, so we want to put those up on the screen and see whether or not they actually give viewers a little bit better idea of... Yeah, there's, there's a close-up. I mean, yeah, right. close-up again, about a three-eighths of an inch and long, not quite a quarter of an inch. They're flattened. They're sort of a mahogany color. And <clears> actually, <throat> if you disturb them, there's often a very strong odor, like many bugs, like a stink bug. When you disturb a stink bug, you have that odor. You get the same thing with the, uh, the bed bugs. Again, you know, I'm feeding, I was letting it feed on me. What's sort of interesting about bed bugs, they are not known to transmit any disease pathogens, any organisms. So again, they, they, don't, they aren't a disease risk, uh, but certainly uh, they, they're not something you want to have in your house. Perfect, and I know we have a good website, so we'll make yeah, sure people can Yeah, and it's yeah, the, good, the, the, the Lancaster County uh, Extension website that Barb Og has put together, Dr. Bob Og, uh, is one of the best in the nation. I really, it's a great one. All the information, everything you want to know is there, Excellent. and more. Excellent, thanks, Fred. Okay, Zach, your first question, I think, also comes with a picture. Uh, this is a viewer in Bennington. And um, it's, a, it's a late fall picture. So one of the interesting things about some of these images that we're going to show <coughs> is that these were things from last year, but they may be things we want to control now. Uh, this is what his backyard is doing. And he says this was all bedded down and looked like it was crawling around in his yard <laughs> and choking his yard to death. Uh, spreading, they want to know what it is. Uh, they power raked, whether that was a good idea or whether that actually spread it worse. Um, so, so he wants to know what in the world. What to do. First thing to do is uh, identify what the grass is and the way it looks, uh, it's one of three grasses. And if it <coughs> stayed green, <coughs> excuse me, if it stayed green going into the fall, it was uh, likely creeping bent grass. And that has a pretty easy control uh, called tenacity. <coughs> if it turned brown, uh, it was either nimble will, which can also be controlled by tenacity, or uh, it could also be uh, potentially zoysia grass. Doesn't look like zoysia grass. And so <clears throat> identification is the first thing. And then once you, f you figure out what it is, you can, you can control it. The other thing, if, it's, if it was an irrigated lawn, odds are it's creeping bent grass. But we have a, a publication on our web page uh, <coughs> uh, called Controlling Perennial Grass, ID and Control of Perennial Grasses. And that one will be on there. Great, excellent, thanks, Zach. All right, Lauren, I'm gonna kick this, this <coughs> set of pictures to you, and then maybe Jeff wants to weigh in on this too. Uh, again, this is a, a late fall picture, but it certainly has application right now. Um, blue spruce that has been defoliated, and they, they hadn't had worms in it or anything like that. They didn't think, lots and lots of sort of brownish top, whether it's a canker, whether it's any of those other things. Um, I don't know on that one, Lauren. What do you think, and, and what can they do about it? Yeah, so uh, just, just a couple different things, you know, when we see, you know, first of all, this time of year we're seeing a lot of winter desiccation injury uh, with some of the trees. So you can see that. When we see specific branches, like in this one, usually when you follow that back, you'll find some sort of a canker or physical injury on the branch. Uh, with dry conditions, Betrao diplodia is one that's quite common. Uh, you would typically find some sort of a, a swollen area or an area with a lot of sap exuding or resin uh, from the branch. You know, even a crack with that would, would be an indication of something. So, I, you know, in that situation, I'd take that back probably, you know, in that two to three inch zone behind the, the affected area. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times these can take tops out of trees and, and such. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes it gets to be a quality call if you want to maintain that tree or if it's going to be damaged enough that you actually need to replace it and go ahead and bite the bullet on it. Okay. So I don't know if Jeff, if you'd. No, I agree anything. with that. That, I mean, that would be yeah. my thought as well. So. Yeah, once you lose the top of the tree, there's really no point. You've lost the integrity of the tree, time to replace it. So, Jeff, in, in terms of the drought damage, and I know we have a segment later on uh, talking about winter injury, are there specific species that you've seen either on campus or in Lincoln that are showing evergreens in particular mm -hmm. the worst drought? You know, people are, keep asking the questions about if it doesn't have needles or it's brown, will it come back? 
Yeah, and so what our evergreens know would be the answer to that question. And as far as what I'm seeing, you know, I've uh, early on uh, last fall, we were seeing a lot of Norway <coughs> spruce. Uh, it seemed like they kind of were delayed in their response to the drought. Mm -hmm. uh, over the winter, I'm seeing um, a little bit more with the pines. There has been some, some dieback, some tips on spruce that I've seen throughout the um, winter months, but mostly I'm seeing some of the pines. I've noticed white pine in particular uh, as we go through the winter has yep, have kind of suffered. Pine. So so that would be kind of my thought right now. Okay, Fred, uh, we actually have a picture for you as well that probably ties into that last series of questions on damage to the spruce. And this was, um, could, ah. could it possibly be spider mite damage or, or what should people look for well, on well, that? Well, that, when, uh, when, when Laura and Jeff were kind of talking about that, that spruce tree the being dying and, and all brown or pinkish needles, you know, I thought it could have been spider mites from the previous year, from last summer and fall. And then with the drought stress, the, the moisture stress, you know, then that tree is, uh, has died. But again, at this time of year, uh, now is the time to be out looking for spruce spider mites. So we have two different spider mites that affect uh, spruce trees. We have in the spring, we have spruce spider mite and then two spotted spider mite late in the fall, so or in the summer. So th we probably saw, we could have seen some damage on that spruce from spider mites last summer. And then this year, it would be all set up and stressed, ready for spruce spite. So again, tree, if you have trees that, uh, spruce trees that are looking a little, a little some pinkish, or you know, sort of brown needles, yellow needles, go out. And I like to use the, the tap technique. Just take some of those needles and give it a good tap out, put your glove on, tap it out, and look for the little spider mites running around on the, on the paper. And if that's the case, you probably want to treat them. I like, you could use permethrin, uh, which would be eight, or one of the bifenthrin products, uh, if, if the mites are there. If not, it's probably some of the things that Lauren and, uh, and Jeff talked about. Excellent. Thanks, Fred. All these issues with our beautiful spruce. Oh, yeah. Okay, Zach, and all these issues with our winter kill in the turf. Uh, this question is from a, a, a Lincoln viewer. Uh, pretty sure a sizable piece of their lawn did not make it through the year. They want to reseed with bluegrass, or they could, but the real question is, is there a better type of turf to withstand dry and droughty conditions? Uh, yeah. Uh we're going to have lots of questions all year long about uh, dead grass, dead plants. And if, you're, if your lawn did not green up going into winter, there's a really good chance that it's not going to resurrect over the winter. And so there's going to be lots of dead, as, as I was driving back from Valentine today. Lots of grayish grass. If, you're, if your grass is tan, a whitish tan, that's pretty healthy. But if it's grayish, that's a sign it's starting to, it's starting to rot away. So bottom line is <clears throat> spring is a tough time to seed. Uh, bluegrass is pretty drought tolerant. Uh, actually one of the better drought tolerant grasses we have. Uh, buffalo grass is uh, even more drought tolerant than that. The problem with that, it's a warm season grass. I love buffalo grass because it takes irrigation to get started, but after that it doesn't take any irrigation after the first year of, of, of uh, establishment. Tall fescue is also out there. It's much, much deeper rooted than Kentucky bluegrass. Actually uses a little bit more water than bluegrass, but with such deep roots, it stays green between the infrequent rains that we have in Nebraska. Okay. So you have really three choices, bluegrass, tall fescue, and <coughs> buffalo grass. Excellent. Thanks, Zach. All right, Lauren, I'm going to throw this to you, and you might bounce it to Jeff also. It's an interesting question. Um, this viewer is wondering about natural needle drop on healthy pines and, the, and, and how you can actually compare the difference between the natural needle drop and disease. And, and are there cycles in which the, he would look for either the disease or the natural drop? I'll just throw out my part about differentiating the two, and I'm going to flip it to Jeff on cycles because I'm not sure exactly, you know, on different ones. But how, how I would differentiate that is a natural needle drop event usually is going to be over a large portion of the tree at one time. Typically, disease events occur over a small isolated area or will be real, real randomly distributed or associated with a certain side of the tree. For example, the north side of the tree or something where you have longer dew periods. So that's usually how I differentiate it. I know the ones that I see most often for calls is typically white pine, I think, Jeff. And, yep. and so how do you, are there other cycles though? That well, and, and what we're looking for with those, um, a couple previous seasons needles are going to be those inner, usually it's that kind of inner cone that we'll see with white pine. 
that you'll notice that we'll have that, like you're saying, kind of sudden yellowing of needles, and we'll get that call as my pine dying. Um, and you're right, I, I'm usually, I'm, I'm not very concerned about it, it's the exterior tips, the, the, those branches and those needles on the exterior of the plant that I'm concerned about, so. Okay, good, thanks guys. Uh, Jeff, we're gonna stick with you with a fairly quick question, I think. This viewer wants to know about pruning their viburnums right now, not sure whether they're gonna catch the flower buds or sure. not. right, yeah. So the quick answer is no. Uh, the complicated answer is, you know, this isn't a bad time to look at any of your flowering shrubs and look and see if you have some broken crossing branches, all those things we talk about every year about what to do. But, you know, we want to avoid our early flowering shrubs, our, our lilacs and our viburnums, especially our forsythia right now. Wait till they do their flowering and then we can do, if you want to do some caning, do it then. All right, Fred, uh, green growing and white. <laughs> this is scale on Euonymus. Oh, yes. And, and the question is, this viewer is wondering, is it too late for dormant oil? and too early for anything else, or what do they do right now? Well, the, well, the challenge on, on Euonymus, normally we use a dormant oil uh, mm -hmm. against the trees that, that are dormant. Now, Euonymus, now I wonder if this is, a, is the winged Euonymus, or if we're talking about the vine Euonymus. They didn't say. Because the vine yeah. Euonymus stays green all year long, and I would be very careful about using a dormant oil on, on the vine type of, of Euonymus. Okay. And that's where we usually see the scales. If this is a, a winged Euonymus, or, and it's like something like oyster shell, no, we could still use the a dormant oil uh, on, on those plants, as long as there's no green tissue showing. But, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to just use a, uh, a residual spray, a, a, a spray on the plants once the uh, scale crawlers have started to, to migrate. Okay. And you know, that's probably a better way of doing it. Okay, excellent, thanks Fred. All right, Zach, this is a Columbus viewer who uh, let their backyard go dormant due to the drought, concentrated on the garden and the trees. Uh, however, they have numerous spots where the turf is reduced to dirt. They want soil, they, please. Soil. Oh, God, soil, please. I think this person says dirt on purpose. <laughs> okay. uh, they're thinking of reseeding uh, with buffalo grass, and they want to know if buffalo grass can be mixed with Kentucky Blue, and will it eventually take over the yard? Is that a good idea? Uh, buffalo grass, again, it's a great grass. Uh, it is not really competitive with cool season grasses. If you want to start out with it, you could probably do that. And then <clears throat> each fall or each in the middle of each winter, just spray out more and more of the Kentucky bluegrass with uh, uh, Roundup, and that will let the buffalo grass uh, compete where the, where the bluegrass was. On the, on the screen is a good picture of uh, Kentucky oh. bluegrass and buffalo grass competing, and this happens to be in mower stripes. And uh, <coughs> you can see where, it, where it's compacted. The bluegrass really does a much better job than the buffalo grass. This demonstrates, the picture demonstrates a couple of things. Uh, number one, you could easily have controlled the, the Kentucky bluegrass with Roundup during the winter alternate your mowing patterns. Uh, this is obviously on a median, but you really have to alternate your mowing patterns. Uh, that compaction is not good for any grass, whether it's bluegrass or buffalo grass or tall fescue. Excellent, thanks Zach. All right, Lauren, last year was a great year for rust on things like hawthorns. Mm -hmm. And this viewer didn't say which hawthorn it is, but, but they did say that they had a lot of rust. They're wondering when they control and with what. To, to try to keep that from happening again, short of cutting down the tree. Okay, so uh, cedar hawthorn, cedar apple rust, actually I, I have a, a gall that I wanna show here, which I really like to do different types of artwork. And, and this is one thing that you could easily incorporate into any flower arrangement. Oh, and it gives you an opportunity to talk about plant pathology at any time when somebody comes by, because then you can talk about disease cycles and how this is on a juniper tree and it would produce spores and come over to the apple tree and so you don't have to worry about protecting the apple tree until you see these things swell and produce their tendril horns and, and emerge. So, but again, what an attractive little piece to put into a centerpiece. And for the hawthorn, it's same way. It, it really, you, it's later in the year that you're going to be looking at control. So these things are going to come off the junipers and they're going to come into to the hawthorns and the apples and such. So in that really, probably early May, you could start looking at applications if you want to fully protect. Uh, but again, watch the cedars for timing. All right, and for our viewers, somehow or another, he did that with an almost straight face. Not that we have any fun on the show. 
It was completely serious. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Mr. Artistic. <laughs> okay, Jeff. Uh, we have a viewer in Northeast Nebraska, and they're looking for a recommendation for a new tree. Okay. They prefer one that's that tops out at 30 feet or under. Mm -hmm. So, any ideas for species suggestions there? Well, if they're thinking about an evergreen, you know, they can think about uh, Serbian spruce. Seems to do pretty well. Um, we've had good luck with uh, Bosnian pine is another one if you're thinking about an evergreen. There's a couple ideas. For um, deciduous trees, uh, the uh, hop horn beam, uh, ironwood, is uh, a good choice for something that doesn't usually get very tall. Um, will stay under 20 feet typically. There's a lot of choices with more ornamental trees. We talked about hawthorns. Uh, certainly there are many choices there and crab apples are another one and I know people sometimes want to say, oh, I don't want a crab apple, but you know, they look nice, they have mm -hmm. good fall color, they have good uh, spring color, and, and so there's that year-round interest, so that's another idea. There's some smaller maples out there, not so many, not so much some of the Japanese maples, but there are some smaller maples that you could uh, look at, you know, a good, a good source would be the NSA website, uh, the arboretum.unl.edu, mm -hmm. right, right. and uh, they really have a, a nice listing with sizes and, and some suggestions there. So there are a lot of good choices out there. It's really All right, good. we have for you, Fred, a question from a viewer uh, that you actually happen to bring a sample in, and that would be box elder bugs are covering the walls, the yes. house. Um, what to do. So there they are. And actually this week when we were pruning up here, Jeff at NET, they were all over the walls at, oh. on the building too. In the dairy store. Yeah. So actually I collected these right at, right at the dairy store. Oops. So so <laughs> the ones that are in the house that have already come into the house, you know, vacuum them up. I mean, there's, you really don't want to be spraying for them and, and more will probably be coming in. But what you can do around the outside of the foundation is scrape away some of that debris and remove the debris. That's where they're hiding. That's where they're congregating, particularly on the south side. Again, I, I don't recommend a, a spray unless they're very abundant. Then you could use something like uh, like eight, like permethrin or like bifenthrin or any of the, any of the sprays. But probably don't want to do that. You know, if you can remove some of that, that loose debris where they're hiding, uh, that would certainly help. And again, they're seed feeders. So they're up feeding on the on the ash seeds, on the actually, box elder and so on. So last year we had a lot of seed production in our uh, shade trees. And so this year we had a lot of box elder bugs. Excellent, I think they're fun. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay, Zach, you have yet another buffalo grass question. <laughs> <laughs> the People season. are really excited about this. Buffalo grass, it's a great grass, especially yeah. after last year's drought. It, it really yeah. shines in drought. Well, mm -hmm. and this, this one is actually, um, this has weeds and probably cool season grasses in it mm -hmm. to a greater extent than the buffalo grass. So, so now what? Uh, now what? Uh, now, as of today, it's getting a little dicey. We, uh, actually, we're doing an experiment checking this for sure, but we get a little, uh, once we get past February, we have a hard, we, we really hesitant to spraying anything over the top of the buffalo grass, especially when it's getting closer and closer to turning green. Uh, in the middle of the winter, sometime between uh, November, December, January, Roundup over the top of that would have taken out the, the, uh, the Kentucky bluegrass in this case. There's some other herbicides that, that we can get into after that buffalo grass is, is greened up and so uh, a number of products that we can use in, in uh, late June. So, so if people don't want to go the herbicide route, uh, are there any other methods of controlling those those weeds in buffalo grass or? That's, again, buffalo grass is, it, it's a great grass in terms of drought and a lot of the weeds won't survive because of uh, you keep it dry, but it's it does it's gonna take a little bit, likely get, uh, take some herbicides to clean them out once and for all, and then the buffalo grass will fill in. Okay, excellent, thanks. All right, you also have a picture, Lauren. Um, this is a viewer who sent an image, and, and this was a last spring, and they, but they didn't get it fixed, and so they're wondering if they're going to see the same thing again. And what it is, of course, is a hosta that has um, a bit of hosta around the edges and a bit of nothing in the middle. They want to know if that this is, is really this. cool. I, I believe that's artwork. So you were talking that to is, the right person. It's a crop is, circle. Yes, that is really neat. So my my guess here would be that maybe it's had a crown and root rot in the inside which has killed the, the older plants, and then you have younger plants trying to grow and come up around that. That's that's just a guess. I, that's where it was started, or something else maybe? Well, I'd right? lift up one more because I've seen this. Some, voles. 
Oh, Foals okay. will go in, and that's exactly what they'll do. They'll go right mm. to the middle, and they'll eat out, eat from the inside out, and you get this little ring of hostas. So, yeah, could be, yeah. you know, again, look look for the little vole trails out on the lawn. Mm -hmm. And if you've got voles, that's probably yeah, what's, that too. what's causing that. Good. And again, mm -hmm. you can take those little, the, the little ones that are coming up and replant them back mm -hmm. in the middle. Mm -hmm. Then you got to take care of the voles. And we'll wait till uh, Dennis is on and let him tell us how to do that. Or we could talk about how we did it today in the garden, couldn't we, Jeff? Oh. We're not going to do. No. <laughs> so so it's, it's not curly top or any of those I random really diseases. I really think so looking at okay. it. No, I, yeah, voles actually sound pretty good. If okay. That, yeah. We're old age, getting a bald spot on top. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen. Okay, okay, Jeff, we, <laughs> we, have, we have a question for you from a viewer about pruning ginkgos. Okay. And I think we have a good picture, and they've actually put in this one, if I'm not mistaken, some, mm. some slashes that they're wanting to do the pruning in. Right. Uh, they're all leaning north due to the st strong spring summer winds. They're not forming central leaders. Mm -hmm. They want to know um, how much pruning they should do at one time and are they headed in the right direction with these pruning cuts? Sure. Well, you can see the mark they have on the on the left side. Um, there's a branch set of that is showing included bark and so that's one I would target first and I would look throughout the tree and see if, if that's repeated in some other places and take those off. You know, again, kind of the, the usual crossing and damaged branches, we want to take those off as well. That's where I would start with this tree and I would say with a lot of our pruning this year, I would be um, hesitant to get too carried away with our pruning after mm -hmm. what the trees went through um, in the last year. And it's the same with our, our turf as well. You know, you, I know Zach talked about aerating. I, I think even in some spots, I'd, I'd worry about doing more damage. You know, that's why I'm saying wait till things are really actively growing. So, so I think with that, I would start with this this year, take out the other crossing and, and damaged ones, and then look at it next year to take some more out. Right, and I think one of the old rules of thumb was no more than a third. Right. Aren't we kind of saying maybe a fourth or less? Yeah, I would say maybe 20%. Yeah. All right, Fred, you have an image, um, and this, this creature I hope is not living just yet, but the question <coughs> from a viewer is whether we have tussock moths in Nebraska, and what does the caterpillar look like? And there well, it that's is. That's what it looks like. And, and what, what do they, what, what yeah. do we see them on? Well, generally we see them on, on deciduous trees. So uh, hackberry, oak, maple uh, would be some of the common ones. I think <clears throat> on cottonwood perhaps. Uh, don't think of, don't see them on evergreens very often, at least I haven't. So again, yeah, they're fairly common. They're a defoliator. Uh, once in a while they will reach the num high enough numbers that they need to be treated, but that's fairly infrequently. You know, generally there's a few here and a few there, and we don't worry too much about them, and they are certainly are a gorgeous caterpillar. The moths are kind of a nondescript little brown miller, so okay. the, the, the adults aren't particularly impressive, but the caterpillars are really cool. So really worth watching instead of killing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. All right, Zach, um, you've maybe talked about this, but we have a viewer who sent us a picture of one that's a bit bigger. Something with a narrow blade and it's along the sidewalks and it's sort oh. of grass-like, but not really grass-like. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's not that's knotweed again. Looks like knotweed, and I assume this is probably a farther east and maybe a little bit farther south in a south exposure. And again, when it comes up, it looks a lot like crabgrass or maybe uh, turf grass seedlings. But then after it gets into the two and three leaf stage, the, the leaf tips become uh, rounded. And that's mm -hmm. when you can tell it's not weed. And then it'll start to vine out. And it is, it's very difficult to control. Uh, 2,4-D or something like that will control it. But it's going to continue to germinate for the next mm -hmm. you know, three, four, five, six weeks, depending on the weather. And then it'll be replaced by other summer annuals if you control that. And so. Those hots, that's why I said get rid of the hot spots. Anything you can do to make improve the turf or pavers or something like that. Can, can you hoe it out or you can, do you just spread it all over You the can place? rogue it out, you bet. But again, but then what are you going to replace it with? There's right. other seeds in the ground and right. those are they're problematic areas. Okay, thanks Zach. Um, no picture, Lauren, but you mentioned fire blight in, in that last question. This is probably not fire blight, but what it is is this viewer has seen on plum and cherries some, some really nasty, swollen, black, large black things. What is that and how do you control that? Well, and, and if that was a, a, like on plum and cherry we see black knot, which is a large swelling. Um, actually, 
Yeah, it, it's just a large black swelling on the twig, uh, maybe thumb size and diameter compared to the twig, depending on the size, and you can just prune that out. Excellent. Two Thanks. to three inches below. I have seen a number of uh, cherries, big ones, like Canada Red around Lincoln area that are just covered with them. It's very common in the wild plum thickets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see it quite often. Okay, good. All right, Jeff, this, this question actually came to us uh, last fall through uh, email, but it's probably germane to identify it and figure out how to control it now. Uh, a couple of images. She's been fighting this plant for mm -hmm. years. 18 inches tall, blooms in May, thick underground runners that look like bamboo. Mm -hmm. uh, pulling it by hand is pointless. And she wants to, to know how to get rid of it. What's its common name okay. and how do you get rid of it? Uh, looks like bouncing bet. Mm -hmm. It's uh, one of the soap weeds, soap and area. And um, you know, I've, I've had it at home actually and, and it was kind of well behaved. I had it in the verge so the hell strip in my front yard and actually did pretty well. Liked it there. Yeah, there you go. Stayed mm -hmm. well behaved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it slowly faded. You know, it's not there anymore, and I didn't do anything to get rid of it. It just after three or four years, it just kind of went away. So it is rhizominous, and so that's probably part of our issue. Mm -hmm. um, so besides roguing it out, like and kind of following those rhizomes, that may help. Uh, the other side of it would be is is treating it with herbicide, Zach. The glove of death. Yeah, you can. Yeah, the glove. The glove of death. Okay. Describe the glove of, uh, to glove for, of uh, death. Plus a rubber glove over a, uh, then put a terry glove over the top, a terry cloth glove. And then I'd probably use for this, not round up, I'd probably go with a broadleaf herbicide, a two or three way uh, broadleaf herbicide should take out that. And probably best, since it's rhizomatous, best to do that in the fall when it's translocating. Uh, we'll translocate the herbicides down to the rhizomes. Excellent, thanks. All right, Fred, uh, any pred predictions for Japanese beetles this year? Beyond Omaha, they're 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 continue to move uh, move westward. So you know, we've seen more and more in the Lincoln area. So they're they're as far. I'm pretty sure they're about as far west as Grand Island now. Well, we're starting to pick them up a few of them. So they're here to stay in the eastern third of the state, and they're moving north and south and west. And so it's one you're going to need to learn to uh, live with. I told somebody the other day, I only have one ash and a lot of other things. I'd rather have an emerald ash borer than Japanese beetles. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, Japanese beetles, they get into our, the, the grubs get in the turf, yeah. and they're a major turf pest, and then the adults feed on everything that you like in your landscape. <laughs> exactly. But they're pretty. Oh, well, they yeah. are pretty. They're nice green Well, thank color. you. <laughs> okay, we have a question that came to us through Facebook, Zach. Uh, and they want to know, this is a Lincoln viewer who wants to know whether they should be concerned about annual bluegrass, poa annua. In most home lawns, you, sh you don't have to be concerned about it. Uh, it's only a problem where it gets uh, very, regular ir uh, very regular irrigation. And so we have a publication on our webpage, we'll help you with that. But the best way to control it, if you're starting to get it in your, in your lawn, uh, you'll start seeing the seed heads. It's a yellowish, greenish uh, plant with uh, boat-shaped tips. You'll see a bunch of seed heads in another four weeks or so. If it's getting to be a problem, let, turn off the irrigation in probably July, let the lawn go dormant, which will kill the annual bluegrass, put down the pre-emergent then, because it's a winter annual, it'll prevent it from germinating in, in uh, September. And then once you get the pre-emergent down, water it, let the rest of the turf grass regrow or uh, come out of dormancy, the annual bluegrass will die. Excellent, and would you like to see an example of annual bluegrass <coughs> in a lawn that is not irrigated? Uh, it must be a shaded lawn, probably yours. Must be a <laughs> shaded <laughs> lawn, probably mine. Yeah, that's, uh, that is the, that's the one good side about annual bluegrass or poa annua, it will grow in the shade, so that Yes, it does. Every plant's got its benefits, Every, <laughs> even weeds. <laughs> All right, Lauren, um, are we approaching the, the spray window for apples and cherries and peaches and all those good things for disease control, or are we still some, some time out for people? Well, we're just, you know, I, and I haven't really been watching too close, but really when we start seeing that, you know, in those pink bud stages, those type, you know, with our apples and such, that's when we look at starting that. So right when we start to see, and we start to see those leaves emerge, that's when you're gonna look at control, and particularly at that point, you're looking at scab control. Uh, for a lot of them when we look at the disease com component. And if it's a really dry spring and we don't have a lot of rains and you're seeing that, or if you have an apple variety that you know is scab resistant, you could look at not using that application. All right, excellent, thanks Lauren. 
Jeff, you also have a Facebook question. Oh. Uh, this is a viewer who wants somebody to talk about the benefits of composting. The benefits of composting. Well, um, for us, it's the benefit is we're using reusing some of that plant material that were that waste plant material on campus, so we're reusing it um, and putting it to good use. And so we use it in our shrub beds or perennial beds around new trees and shrubs and that sort of thing. Um, even with some of our new seedings, if I know if I'm confident, I'm fairly weed free with it. So it's it beats hauling it away and spending all the time, and you feel like you're getting some benefit out of it. So. Excellent. Well, Lots I know, of benefits. I know it's one of those things that people either love to do it or hate to turn it. It's yeah. usually the hating to turn. It's good exercise too. So it's good for you. <laughs> exactly. Fred, we're about out of time here, but uh, we had a question about bullet galls on oaks. And, and you see them right now, but is there anything that you can right. no, no, do no, other than... No, but, but as soon as it, okay, so the, uh, as soon as it starts to leaf out, that's when the, when the adult, the uh, wasp is laying its eggs. So. If you have bullet galls, the time to treat would be just as the leaves are beginning to expand. That's when the eggs are being laid. So that's as soon as the eggs start, to, leaves start to expand. Probably the next couple of weeks. Okay. Well, I, and I do know that we we actually have seen it a bit on campus, Jeff, and and of course there, out. There's out nothing west. in them right now. Th okay. Those are em those are empty. Right. They they turn into pretty good um, weapons if you have a group of students that discover something on a tree that they can pluck and throw at one another. <laughs> Cedar apple rust galls would work to that too. Yeah. <laughs> you are, you, you know, we're not going to let you bring anything that you can create with. I'm going to find a hundred uses for cedar apple rust galls. <laughs> All right.